Oh my God, am I excited to welcome all of you to Manifesting with Meg today, our special edition at two o'clock. So thank you all for coming and enjoying this conversation that I have for you. I have one of the most incredible talents and generous people that I've ever seen in my life. Joining me today, Adriana Trigiani is joining us today on Manifesting with Meg. And without further ado, I'm gonna bring her on and introduce her all to you. So here we go. Adriana Trigiani, the author of so many books, but her new one coming out on April 26th, The Good Left Undone. How excited am I that you're here to have this conversation? I'm Man ready to manifest, Meg, ready to I, manifest. I, that's amazing. I, you know, one of the things that I love and I always want to remind everybody is this is a very intentional show. So I want to make sure everyone knows that we have this little book called The Magical Guide to Bliss. We set our intentions and we pick a number and then hopefully at the end we'll all come together synchronistically manifesting away and without further ado i just want to remind everybody this is episode 90 of my show like i said adriana trigiani's here the theme today is follow the golden rule transformation dreams inspiration true happiness and discovering bliss is what we're after we're always just a conversation away there you go from extraordinary I'd like to say time to wake up to a universe packed with possibility. And we've already got people coming in saying they're so excited to meet you, Adriana. They love you. They think that you're amazing. These are all authors so far on with us and we're just gonna just dazzle today. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Meg. I'm beyond excited. I, I love the fact that you come from the beautiful Italian roots that I have. So I feel like, you know, the language that we might speak, whether in English or perhaps in Italian, exactly, <laughs> would be on point today. And I, like I said, Suzanne's saying her whole family loves you. They all love you. I love the Simonettis. What can I say? And I love, I love Rachel Mickelberg. He says she talked to the coolest people. Yeah, no, no. And then there's Ross. Rec Doc Ross. Yes, she's I'm amazing. So to meet to meet her. Yes. Uh, no. So I do want to like ask all of you to sit back, relax, ask as many questions as you could possibly get out. I have had the privilege of reading her new book, The Good Left Undone, and you guys are just going to be blown away. It is so exciting because it takes you on a journey, and I love an adventure, and I love when someone takes you into the book and visualizations come alive in my own imagination. So that is what you're going to get, but I definitely have to introduce this wonderful woman. She is a New York Times bestselling author of 20 books of fiction and nonfiction. That alone is amazing because all you authors out there know how hard it is to even put one together. She is the bestseller of author of The Shoemaker's uh, Wife, which was one of her many. I fell in love with her memoir, Don't Sing at the Table, but we'll talk about that later. Her books have been published in 38 languages around the world. She's an award winning playwright television writer and producer and filmmaker. Nobody told this woman that she could not do whatever she put her mind uh -huh. to. That is for sure. <laughs> that is for sure. Oh my God. But like I said, if you read her memoir, you know the kind of women that she was born to. So literally they must have like kept feeding in her brain all the wonderful things that she is and that she could do and look at her now. Among her screen credits, she wrote and directed major motion picture adaptation of her debut novel, Big Stone Gap, which I would recommend all of you guys to see. It's truly a beautiful, beautiful movie. Adriana, she grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, where she co-founded The Origin Project, which I find amazing because when you succeed, you give back to those people that are a part of your world. It's just such an incredible magical moment. And I think that I would love for you to speak to that today as well. She's proud to serve on the New York State Council of the Arts. She lives in New York City with her family. Without further ado, Adriana, did I miss anything that I should have said? That was okay. Now we know what happens at my funeral. <laughs> Oh God, I have a feeling that, you know, the party starts now and then the funeral is done, girls. I hope you have your drink on. You know, Louis B. Free, uh, the brain fruit from the uh, from the heartland, interviewed my daughter the other day and she said, you know, I'm going to be the lady who's singing in my singing in my grave. They're all going to say, hey, lady, could you shut up? It's too loud over there. So there you go. It's an honor for me to be with you, Meg, because oh. you are a woman of such achievement and accomplishment. I love your books. I think you do an extraordinary job 
of getting us spiritually aligned to try to get the job done, whatever the job is, as we define it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Wow. I, I, I thank you so much. And, you know, I, I had the privilege of seeing you honored at NOYA, which is a National Italian American Organ uh, Organization of Women. And I just, you know, it's funny because I do pay attention a lot to the people who show up in my world. And you were just this bright light and this light that's going to go further. And, and when I see you on your Adriana Inc. show, you actually light a candle and the people that you're interviewing. It's, it's fascinating because I think that if you come with that generosity of spirit and that light that just is infectious for everyone or contagious, let's say, you know, it, you're just passing on a torch that's going to have a ripple effect that goes beyond your mm -hmm. even imagination. Really? So I'm hoping. Oh my God. Isn't that really the dream? Hoping. <laughs> and you inspire women, which gets me going because, you know, the more women who speak louder, and that's what I loved most about your book, is that you have strong woman characters, and they also speak to the possibility of, you know, go out there and do your thing, shine the way you should be. So I wanted to start today, if you don't mind, um, before we start talking about the book, you know, following the theme, and I love it, theme falls on today's date, March 23rd of the Magical Guide to Bliss, it's follow the golden rule. And if there's anything that you speak to in your show, it's clearly aligned to that. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. And if you're out in the world and you're out in the world, movies, filmmaking, all of it, you get all the bad and the good and the ugly, I'm sure. Yeah. But if you show up with this wonderful notion of who you are, ready to serve from that place of love that you were taught as a child, I'm sure, because you can see it in all your books, then what comes back to you is very beautiful and loving too, even in the dark, even in the most challenging places. Cause I'm not going to say that life isn't challenging cause it is. So, you know, what are your thoughts on this? I, I would love to know, especially coming off on your like 38 books after that experience and everything else. Well, you know, Meg, um, I, I was thinking about you before we did the show today and, and just thinking about how you put out such goodness in the world. And, and I, and I have to tell you, I think, it's about how we commit to something, mm. what we really believe. Yeah. And frankly, uh, somebody gave me some good advice many years ago, which I will share with you. And there's a component about that that I want to talk about today. And, and so, so he said, find the thing you love to do, mm. be the best at it, and serve humanity. Oh, I love it. But there's a fourth one in there for women that I think we really need to address, and that is to recognize achievement. Oh, I love it. Because every day, look look at the beautiful things you just said to me. I could have had the worst morning and I come on and my friend, a fellow woman, a fellow author says these beautiful things. I get recognized for my work. Okay. Women in general never do. Mm. My mother was never recognized for her work. My grandmothers weren't. And I guess my commitment is in terms of the golden rule, it's not just do unto others as you would have them do unto you, but do unto others and recognize them. Oh, that's awesome. For what they've done for you. And I'm, um, I, I'm known to pick up the phone and call women and say, you need to write that book. Where's your book? Or um, there's a particular author that uh, others are directing her work. And I said, and I watch her Instagram and I said, you need to be directing. Wow. You can write and direct your own work. And yeah. she got teary on the phone. I said, you got to listen to me. Directing is not some male form of art. They give the men the money back in the day. And I, I kind of fight that. Mm -hmm. And I say, I, I do it maybe better at least as well but usually better than my male counterparts would do it and 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 that's that's okay because men respond to competition maybe they'll get their game on but i'm appalled when i go back and watch movies with my daughter at the portrayal of women in them Mm. And you know, when I was growing up, you know, these the movies that were big were like the John Hughes movies. Remember that? Yeah, absolutely. Sixteen Candles. <laughs> Candles was a big movie for me. They, they were all big. And you go back and watch them now, and there's it's misogyny on steroids, you know. And at the time, the culture was in such a condition that you didn't really pay attention to that. Like I love Bill Murray. I watched Meatballs. The portrayal of women in his movie is horrifying. 
terrible. Horrifying. Yeah. He's very funny, but the women are like salad dressing. Yeah. So I come up in that, but I wasn't of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I thought I'm going to write women as I see them. And of course I worked in television and I worked for a lot of big famous stars and loved doing it. But I began to have within me this, it's almost like an earthquake starts to happen. It's your plate shift. Yeah. And you write about the people that I know. You got to write the stories I've heard, you know? And that's why there's 20 books and there'll probably be 20 more before I'm dead if I live that long. Because I, I don't have time to, you know, I won't, I'll run out of years to tell them all. Yeah. And I just say this to you, to everyone within the sound of my voice, is you can do this. You can do it. You can do it. I love that. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people in my former profession were all looking at me when I jumped out into this world of creativity, like thinking that it's impossible. What are you doing? You're starting at, I was almost 48 years old. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I do not want to have any regrets when it's my time. So the bottom line, what you're just saying to all these that are listening is that if you've got a dream in your heart, you can do this. You have you to also have the technology. Yes. Okay. Meg, you're a fantastic interviewer. You're a great, you're a great television journalist. It's if we call this as a visual thing. Well, now we find that out. Without these platforms, mm -hmm. you would never know it unless you figured out a way to be a wife, a mother, and a thing and a thing and a writer and a thing and a thing and go to a television station. Yeah. But look at the tools. Use the tools at your disposal. Yeah. The phone is one of the great writing assistants. Amazing. You get an idea and then I put it in there. Put it in there. You can edit it later, but you observe something, write about it, yeah. share it. You know, that's where I'm coming from. I, I, you got to live in your moment. And there's so much to recommend the moment. You know, I think that I think a lot of people also wonder, like, how am I going to start now? But they forget the foundation they've laid up. Oh, okay, I don't want to hear that. Yeah. I'm gonna, I, now I'm going to I'm going to take everybody out with this. OK. <laughs> the great Judith Krantz started at the age of 50. Now, she was a journalist prior to being a novelist, but she wrote all those great Princess Daisy scruples, you name it, from age 50 to age 70. And she she picked a date to get out. Mary Higgins Clark's husband died suddenly. She had five babies at home. She didn't know what she was going to do. She was in her 40s and she pulled the typewriter out and wrote a novel about George Washington. You can read about her. Yeah. The great Frank McCourt was a school teacher till he was well into his 60s. And after he was the age of 70, he, Angela's Ashes got published. That's amazing. I'm going to keep going yeah. because the, the, the age thing is cuckoo particularly in writing, because I think with writing, you need a vantage point. That's not to say that there aren't people that are, you know, 18 that do this beautifully. They're wunderkinds. Okay. But I love to read the authors that are seasoned and came into the life experience. And I love to read the young ones too. Don't get me wrong. One of my favorites is Nick Stone. She's a young mother and she writes these incredible YAs. Um, there are great authors of every, but there's no postage stamp. There's no way you have to look. There's no education level. I just talked to an author last night that uh, got her GED in the mail. Wow. You don't even need that. Yeah. What, but what you do have to do is you have to make the time for your creative life. Because if you don't do it, if it's not organized within an inch of your life, it's not going to get done. It's, it's just like being a mother. Uh, you, you, you acquiesce almost to the children's schedule. You have to figure it all out. Right. So the, the first thing I say is look around your house and you've got to find a spot. I wrote 18 bestsellers in a laundry room. Wow. Okay. Cause it's the only room with a door on it that I can <laughs> to lock them out. They yeah. stay out. <laughs> go out and do my thing in there. Right. Yeah. But, but my point is, you must create in your home a sacred space where you do your writing, where you do nothing else. I'm going to allow you to have coffee at that table and I'm going to allow you to eat your lunch there. But but it can't have the grocery list. It can't have um, the to do list in the house. It can't have the bills. It must be your sacred space for writing. OK. And then once you have that set up, some people are in a closet doing this. OK. Wow. Can't be your kitchen table. It's got to be a place where nobody else can, where, where the children understand. And you have, don't touch that table. 
Right. I get crazy about my pens. Uh, I'll tell if my assistant picks up the pen and uses it. <laughs> my pen. Because the, because the, the felt lands funny, okay? So that's how you got to be absolutely militaristic about that, okay? Then the second thing is, this is a big one. Oh, and, and you're going to hate me for, you're going to hate me for the first six weeks and then you're going to love me. Get up two hours earlier than everybody in your house. Uh I think that's key. Two hours. <laughs> Two hours. <sighs> One, to wake up, have your coffee, and then an hour to work. And then eventually you're going to be working the whole two hours, but just give yourself a break. I but love start it. it. And once you get in the habit, are you kidding? I was never an early riser. <laughs> no. I didn't have it in me. <sighs> now I do. Yeah. Now I'm, it's as natural to me. And in fact, I savor it. There's no bells on. Okay. Um, Eric Hannah just said, I had dinner with Judith Krantz many years ago at my former publisher, Jeremy Tarcher, who was incidentally Miss Krantz's brother. Oh my gosh, you should write a book. What a <laughs> inspiration. Yeah, Judith Krantz. I had one dinner with her, Eric, and I, I was done. She told me everything to do, and I have lived by her ever since. Oh my God. So she's the one who gave you all of this wonderful advice. Yeah, she didn't tell me about the sacred. This is all my stuff, but her right. stuff was incredible. Her yeah. stuff was. Uh, was about owning the time and uh, knowing when to get out, when to get in. Basically, so I have a question for you. Did you ever really think that you would have these kind of conversations with all of the pro most prominent authors of our time? No, no, no. But four years ago, when I started this, I was terrible at first and no one watched you go, you've been doing it four years, you wouldn't know because I was bad at first. <sighs> if you, the longer you do something, mm. you get good at it. Yeah. You get better and then you get really good. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that the most amazing thing is that you bring a lot of the insights into your books. And I actually am so lucky that you have some, some beautiful visuals to share with everyone from some of your books that you guys have provided with me. So the first one is, and I'd love for you to comment on this because I love this part of my show. Other people's inspirations actually help me because I get to pick them and I like to take them along with me. So all the sacred space you've given us added to this. Life is a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. That was on my cousin's Ralph refrigerator in, in Rosetta, Pennsylvania at 125 Garibaldi Avenue. And I saw it when I was a kid and I never forgot it. And I put it in the novel and I said, some wise person said, I don't know who originally said it, but I put it in the book. Wow. That's awesome. And that stuck with you clearly. It was my just whole life. My whole, it still does. Wow. You know, one of the things I love, though, is visualization. If you have something in front of you constantly, you kind of make it a part of you. If you keep reading Absolutely. It. Yeah. yeah. If you don't see it, you won't get there. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And I think you got to imagine it, see it, and keep imagining it, and building it. Oh, my God. I can't wait to ask you after this where you see yourself going next. But we're going to oh, keep Oh, yeah. <laughs> their inspiration. Yo <laughs> sono la donna. I'm uh, <laughs> ¿Quién es sono la donna? Mm -hmm. Yo sono la donna. So the, tr the truth is where the story begins. This is also from one of your books, All the Stars in the Heaven. Oh, I love that book. That's about the golden age of Hollywood. There's three in a row that are, one's the golden age of Hollywood. One is the golden age of television, Tony's wife and music. Oh, and wow. one is uh, the golden age of theater, post-World War II, and television. Then that is um, Kiss Carlo. Oh, wow. The truth is where the story begins. I mean, what do I need to say about that? It's, it happens to be true. Yeah. I mean, if, 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 if you build anything on a lie, it will collapse. If you build, if the foundation of what you live, do, and write is the truth, you're good olden. You know, as a a former prosecutor, I always tell my kids, integrity. As long as you have and maintain your integrity based in truth and authenticity, no one will ever call you. Like, they can try, but you know who you are. Well, and how do you think I handle reviews? I, yeah. Well, when I made the Big Stone Gap movie, it didn't dawn on me anyone was going to review it. And they and I got brutal reviews for the Big Stone Gap movie. I even got people calling me out because they were emotional at the end of it. But that's my job as a filmmaker. Yeah. Feel something. Yeah. Feel something, right? Well, I mean, if they don't feel anything, what was the point of giving you that no, time? No, no, here's, here's me as the artist. I didn't even think about reviews. I don't care about that. Because it's it's not germane to the creativity. 
if I'm doing something to get attention yeah. or if I'm doing something because I need praise, get out of the arts. So I, had to, yeah. I had to ask you though, what, where do you come in your, in, I know you have a lot of siblings. So where do you lie? Where do you fall? I'm in the middle. I'm in the middle and I think I, I navigate the world. Yeah. I navigate criticism. I navigate success. I navigate all of it like a middle child. Oh, I love it. I am a middle child. All of it. But you have, you have yeah. what, how many in your family? How many kids? There's seven children, five girls, two boys. Wow. And, and you're more. right in the middle. Wow. Wow. I, I think that would have been way too much competition for me. <laughs> I was like, I had two girls. Oh, no, there's, there's tremendous competition. Yeah. It probably still is, but you know, we're grown ups now. So, I mean, we do what we do. But I think, you know, it's funny because even my mother had said, if the oldest child does not, you know, succeed, then the younger ones will follow. So she pinned us against each other. So we would all strive. Oh, that's a great, that's a great <laughs> dynamic. I can relate to that a bit. Yeah. My, yes. mother, my father did it. Oh, your father. Well, your father, you know, I remember that you had said that he suggested you read The Power of the Subconscious Mind. So, of course, I go get it. And there's butterflies all over it. You said that in an interview once. And I was like, this is amazing. It's amazing. Well, it feeds right into what you do. Um, it, I, I work when I sleep. And people go, what does that mean? Well, <laughs> it's, all, it, it's in there. And, it, yeah. and I don't believe in writer's block. I think that's a cuckoo concept. Because yeah. it just basically means the idea is not cooked yet. Oh, wow. I love that. And, you know, they're having, do you do cooking, maybe cookbooks? And actually, you do have a cookbook. Have a family cookbook that was a lot of fun, written with Mary Alonda Trajani, and my sisters did all the recipes. Oh, that's awesome. And, we, and my mother, and we gathered them, and we kind of, the, the focus of the cookbook is the stuff that we love to eat is when we were growing up. Oh my God. Because, I love it. because we could fill 25 cookbooks. Truth That's truth. awesome. Oh my God. My husband's saying about, <laughs> I'll have to wake up at two 30 before everybody else. <laughs> I mean, one of the compensations is you both, we both have kids in college, but you have a young one at home. Yeah. One of the compensations of that is that what nobody tells you. And I, I would like to somebody who sat me down and I I'm doing it now with young women, which is okay. Motherhood is a temp job. <laughs> and by that, I mean the hands on portion of it, if you really stretch it, is 18 years. Yeah. I'm not saying there's not emotional phone calls and there's not, they don't need stuff and you're not a mother for, yeah, all of that is true. But I'm talking about the hands on little Bobby has to go here, little Susie yeah. has to go there, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It ends the day they go to college or it ends the day they move out and get a job. Hmm. So that's 18 years yeah. at box. It's 21, but they say they, they, you know, but the kids are coming home now. Uh, if you hit them, they don't come home. <laughs> is that what your parents said? Get them out. <laughs> Get them out. Stay out. Oh yeah. my God. I'll never come back. That's yeah. Hilarious. Oh my God. And we have another middle child. Suzanne Simonetti is, is. I love awesome. it. Suzanne, you're in the club. <laughs> oh my God. That's I awesome. Dallas. Awesome. I thought I would be just, yes, Aida, you have to get on it. She has a lot of books and we have more crazy, awesome, inspirational quotes. Even with all the bad things, something beautiful can happen. Mm. And that is the queen of the big time. And I haven't had a chance to read that yet, but I love this quote. This is, this is my happy place because I look back and I'm like, yeah, a lot of bad things have happened, but God, something beautiful came from it. What is your it's take on you, it? It's what you focus on, right? Yeah. yeah. If you don't focus on uh, the good you will be a, a malcontent and no one will want to be around you, including yeah. your family. Including so the, this quote is about how out of the most horrible things, there'll be one seed that survives and grows one. And that's all you need. You need one beautiful sign. Oh, that's beautiful. Sometimes for me, it's just the sky. Oh, wow. Sometimes it's just the way the sky looks. Yesterday, I took pictures of there was a blue stripe. Everything else was gray meets gray. And there was a stripe of blue that went like a rainbow. Blue, blue, blue. Yeah. And I, I took so many pictures of it because I went, that's life. Yeah. And it's really odd. So Ida's saying that she hears you on Louis, Louis B. Free, which we love. I love that guy. Show I, okay. Louis B. Free is the greatest. Well, he's saying, she sa she's saying your spirit is so beautiful. And that's amazing to oh, come That's across. so beautiful to say, and I'm coming to Youngstown. I should point that out. I'll be at the Lake Club, and it's coming up in a few weeks. So that's really exciting because as time comes on, you're going out on tour again. Yay! The world. Well, 
you know, I, I listen to the scientists and the doctors and I'm double vaxxed and I'm boosted and I'm careful and we're going to do protocol. So it's ticketed events. So you got to get a ticket yes. and then you get your book with the ticket. What, what could be more perfect? That's perfect. And a show. You get a show with it. And you get a show because, because you definitely are an entertainer, which I love. You know, I have to say, if I can come to a place and really enjoy the person who speaks to me, then I'm definitely going to leave there with more wisdom than I came. And I think that that's the most beautiful thing because if you're, if you're brought in through the entertainment, but you take away what you do give is very intentional wisdom nuggets to take away. It's yeah. fantastic. It's, it's the beauty of the author and the, the reader having that synchronistic or, you know, synergistic opportunity together. And I think that's awesome. I hope you come to Miami. My God, you have to. I think I'm coming close. And uh, uh, Rachel uh, Mickelberg's asking, will you be on the West Coast? Rachel, the California leg of the trip, um, I'm coming as far west as Phoenix, and I'll be at the Poison Pen. But we're doing Warwick's. We're doing a bunch of California bookstores. I think I'm doing Barnes & Noble National with Mitch Album, which will be wonderful. And Taylor Jenkins Reid is going to host me for the California stores. So for crying out loud, don't miss them. Oh and then God. I'm going to come in person eventually. Oh, my God. That's amazing. And. And so there you go, Rachel. She's coming out there to you. Aida, you have to definitely keep your eyes and ears open. Youngstown, she's coming. So here, when people are filled to the brim with love, they are their most beautiful. Lucia, Lucia. And that book, I love that book. I read that book too. Yeah. And I just love I that book. Love that book. And of course, yeah. your grandmother's name. So clearly. But the word Lucia, Lucia in Italian means light. It's light. And this is what, what wonderful, what more wonderful can you get? When people are filled to the brim with love, what light shines and radiates from us and become, we become our most beautiful. Tell us what you, what you were thinking when you wrote these words. Well, the character in the novel, Lucia Sartori, is enamored of, of beauty and she's enamored of beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And her father worried about her because he said, you, you look at the surface too much. Mm -hmm. It's what's beneath the surface that's important. It's not the veneer. Wow. So over the course of her life, this character transforms, as you know, we won't give it away for anybody that hasn't read it. But something happens to her that it shifts her plates, I like to call them inside. And she changes the way she lives her life and she changes the decisions that she makes and she becomes the woman instead of the career girl that she was and, uh, and the wife she was to become, she becomes something completely different. Amazing, amazing. I, and you know what, the evolution of a human person let's say male, female, doesn't matter. When there's that one moment in time where there's that shift, when you realize that it's something more than what it actually seems, you can see such a, such a shift in the whole energy component of the person. Absolutely. And, and I see, I have to say, the last interview you did with one of your, one of your authors, I saw a shift when you actually told one of the authors I see you directing this. And I don't think she ever contemplated that before. I, I saw her whole- I've only movie. said it twice and I'm going to start saying it more when I think they got it. Yeah. And I think she was taken aback. Oh, I, she, um, she, but, she, but she was like, really? You see that in me? You see that in me? I see it in the words. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and we've got to take back this profession. Mm. And by that, I mean the, the movie industry in the United States of America was started by women. Isn't that amazing? And people That's don't know that. Uh, we were we were the directors. We were the writers. We did everything. And then the minute it started making the do re mi, we were now the secretaries. Not that I was a secretary, but I'm just saying, we've done so much of the work. A lot of people don't know that Final Draft, which you write your screenplays on, uh, was a construct of a woman in 1925 who um, who ended up directing the first Ben Hur, which oh, by the way, shot by shot copied her direction in Rome. Wow. Okay, um, and I oh my gosh, Ruth, oh Ruth, what's your last? Name? It'll come to me. But anyway, um, I haven't I haven't talked about this in like five years, so I haven't really talked about her. But um, she Final Draft we still use to this day, and Final Draft is the script format. Right, she invented it. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh-huh. And she directed. Wow. 
So, ladies, and I'm not saying, listen, do I love William Wyler? Yeah. Do I, you know, do I love Frank Capri? Of course. Yeah. I, I love it's George Stevens. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, Billy Wilder, of course. Hey, but the <laughs> women are ju were just as good, if not better. I love it. I mean, who is the key? By the way, we don't get to act like idiots and chuckleheads and misogynists on set. Uh, I, I say it was a cucumber. I love it. I, I, and my, my, woman. I, oh, God forbid you show any emotion whatsoever. I, I do an acting job when I'm, and I'm not a great actress, but <laughs> I know that I have to be better. I know. And I know I have to be better. I can't scream and kick and call actors names. You've seen it on YouTube. I don't have to tell you who they are. It sickens me. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be allowed back on a set. Oh, but it's the almighty dollar. So get in there and make money and you'll see what happens to you. You'll be just fine. You know, I think it's funny because we are truly the keeper of the stories. And when we sit around, like, listen, the mother makes the meals, or she did. My grandmother made the most incredible Italian meals. Of course. The, five different courses, right? We all sat around together of this big, big table, and we were told to tell our stories. And then we pass on those stories so the legacy maintained. And it's the women who direct that. So why wouldn't it be? natural for women to direct in a bigger <laughs> a bigger field i don't get it either i you know and it's you funny because look, look i was a theater major okay i spent years directing i know how to work with actors which is 90 yeah. percent of it the script and the actors have to come to get i know these are all skills but you can develop them yes you can yes. develop these skills don't leave it to them don't take yourself out of the running Wow. What's the worst that's going to happen? You don't get it? Okay, fine. You'll get something else, but you'll get there. So I have a question for you. Do sure. you see women competing with each other in that realm, or is it more of a collaboration? Because well, I find <laughs> they we look. We're so excited on a set when there's a woman doing anything that yeah. you know it's a big deal. But um, I just try to hire based on the movie. Yeah. Uh, but obviously the things that I choose to do have a lot of women characters in them and they're women's stories usually. Oh my God. Although I'm not against a man's story. I mean, I certainly, Mario Cantone started in Rococo on the audio book. So I would love to direct him in that movie. Oh my God. So, I love Mario. You know, I'll just be men, uh, but I, I don't, uh, and I don't think about it as a man's story. Is it a good story? Is yeah. it a story that's going to keep you either turning the pages? Because as you know, in the good left and done, there's as many men in it as there are women, really. But it's about a women's line in a family. You know, it's kind of like what Michael Patrick King said. They're the they're not the protagonist. They're the they're the the secondary characters. The men, even in those, and even in your book, yeah. I, I found that to be the case. And. We'll take you to that beautiful cover. My God, the good left undone. I, you know, I love the fact that the title start. I mean, the book starts off with the quote, and and you can speak to that, and 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 got this title for this wonderful novel from a beautiful passage. Can you share that beautiful passage? Th these are the warnings written by Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. Now, what's very interesting about this is that it played into the story. Perfectly. Perfectly, which I didn't really see coming. Wow. Um, I found this triptych in a, in a church, Soto Omonte, where Pope John the 23rd is from. And I have to be a huge fan of Pope John the 23rd. I love him. And um, this was one of his, one of the things that when he was a boy that he read all the time. And, and so the book begins with three past things. If you want to get to heaven, heed these warnings. St. Bernard says this. One is um, the evil done, yes. the good left undone, and the time wasted. Uh, you can imagine I'm writing during COVID. Oh, my God. And the clock stopped. Oh, we, wow. we lost two years of our lives to this. And, and, and look, for people that are adults, okay, so what? To people that are elderly, it was terrible. And to the young, it was terrible. To the people in the swath of the middle, it was also terrible, but in a different way. Yeah. And, of course, all the loss of life and um, the assessment of the leadership of this country. Yes. Um, I never get political because that's, this is not the arena because we're soul talking here, okay? Yeah. And to me, that is beneath the soul. 
<laughs> that is true. It. It's under it. Yes. Um, I have my opinions. And I certainly work hard to support the good stuff, okay? But when you feed people lies and you set people up and you're not clear with people, I mean, if I did that on the page, I wouldn't sell a single book. Yeah. And I'm writing fiction. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I will I will share with you the quote that you gave me from your beautiful book. Even when we're broken, we're beautiful. My God, if this doesn't speak volumes to what everyone needs to hear right now, because we're all broken. <laughs> we're all broken. Okay, and but from the broken, everybody listen to this. You are the sculptor of your situation. Think of broken pieces of glass and how they become a stained glass window. Mm -hmm. Or think of broken pieces of glass and how they become a fresco or a mosaic. Think about how broken things can be pulled together to recreate a whole. That's how you think about, you must think this way about yourself. Yeah. Whether you just were currently widowed or you lost a child or the, the most horrible losing a child, yeah. whether you um, uh, fell sick, you got cancer, you, you, um, you got sick from something else, you got COVID and you can't, you have no sense of smell now and you cook, whatever the heck the, the, the trial is, your mission is to turn it into beauty. Uh. It's to turn it into beauty. When I'm praying about Ukraine, yeah. And I see these beautiful people being driven from their beautiful homes. They're beautifully dressed. The kids in their little, you know, fur covered thing. They're beautiful. One madman put them out in the street and blew them up with bombs. One guy. How is this possible, ladies? How's it possible? Well, I, I want to say it's happening. It's World War II all over again. And then, you know. That's what you, I was going to say. <laughs> now, now, now do, you, do you realize that these people were thriving? Mm -hmm. Their homes are decimated. Who's going to rebuild those homes? Half of them are dead in the rubble. The rest are on a road to try to get out of there. They're leaving their homes. Now, all of us, you know, I happen to be an Italian immigrant uh, 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 successor, uh, we would call us. Or I happen to be the, the, the product of Italian immigrants. So are you, Meg. Whether you're Irish, whether you're German, whether you're 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 Chinese, Japanese, African American, of course, that's a different conversation because they yeah. were enslaved and brought here. Yeah. Um, forced, forced to come here. Yeah. Please read Alice Randall's Black Bottom Saints. You'll love it. It's uplifting and it's really brilliant. Anyway, my point in all this is, no matter how you you were driven either by circumstance or war or lack or you had to, when you're at your most broken, you're at your most beautiful because of the potential of who you are. We, it, you know, uh, to your point, we all can either. Oh, Rachel, I'm not forgetting my Jewish sister. <laughs> don't ever think I forget you. <laughs> I never do. I don't know where we will be. And it's also. Incredible. Incredible. People. When I've when I've celebrated when I've celebrated with Jewish families, it's almost as like I'm at my Italian. <laughs> well, here's what I always say, okay, as a Catholic. We stole everything from the Jews. We everything. Did. We did. Everybody, when you go, you know, uh once I went to a few Passovers in New York and I went to a few bar mitzvahs, a few bas mitzvahs, I went to a few Jewish funerals. I went, oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah. The absolutely we basically swept it all in. And of course, the blessed mother who we uh, who we love and pray to, who never fails. This is our Jewish mother. She's That's Jewish. <laughs> That's true. It's true. true. So they're, they're loving it. They're like, yeah, Italians and Jews, same thing turned inside out for sure. Absolutely. And you were, you're going to go crazy because in this novel is an incredible, beautiful Venetian gem cutter named Romero Speranza and his wife Agnese and they're Jewish. I love it. That was, yeah, you're going to go crazy. All of you are going to go crazy for the novel. I, I definitely encourage everyone to read it. One of the things I wanted to say is like, it's, it's so funny how 
like back to synchronicity, things happen, you read something and it's so, it's so incredible how it passes over. Like you see the elements of history come again, right? We don't learn our lesson from the past. They'll come and haunt us again. If we don't even go back and see, and I see all the little ties and in your book, you brought it out so beautifully and how, you know, the people were living such a wonderful, you know, a fulfilling life in their small community of Via Reggio. And then, well, I'm not even going to get into the details with regard to what happens in the story, but, but then the world blows up and you see the same kind of themes today. How well, is it? Well, what survives it, Meg? The, the family. Family. <laughs> the family. family, the family, the family. You can blow up our homes. Mm -hmm. You can blow up our relatives. You can, but you can't blow up our souls and you can't blow up our ability to, to, to be, remain loyal Beautiful. and to hold our, our families close. You will never, Mr. Putin, I don't care what you do, you will not destroy that. And, and, I, and, and I not destroy it. And by the way, it's married to democracy. We want to be free to love our families and build our families, don't we? I mean, isn't that the whole point of all of this? It's unbelievable. And you know, and you even take us on a journey. You start us off with the story of the Indian gems, the, in, the gems in India. The story begins in Karur, India. Yes. Yes. And, but you take us, you take us to Italy, you take us to France, you take us to Scotland. And I've often said the books that I love most are when I read them, I feel like I'm at a movie. And I feel like I experience it. it. No, it's the most amazing thing. And then, of course, I have to be careful when I go to the movie because I can definitely see this come to be a movie because I'm like, that's not what happened. <laughs> you know, you want to be well, careful. I'm trying not to make this a movie. I'm trying to make it a series. Oh, that's awesome. I think it's 10 episodes because I don't want to give anybody the short shrift. That's awesome. Yeah. And there's so much there. There's so much story there. Mm -hmm. But you know what really impacted me the most, and I don't know if this was your intention, but it certainly spoke loud and strong, is back to the strong woman and I, how yeah. grateful yeah. I am today with all the opportunities because of women characters and real women in your book who actually took the helm and then did what they had to do because they were called to do so. And it wasn't easy. Yeah. And I love that you did that. So tell me, like, what was your intention when you wrote the book? And I know the story. I don't know if you want to share the, the story when you went to the church. Sure. Okay, please do. I love the story. I don't like, I'm all about pay attention to that kind of stuff, that inspiration. Go ahead. So I was hired to direct Kathy Lee Gifford and Craig Ferguson in a movie in Scotland. And there's a wedding in the movie. If you haven't seen it, you'll love it. It's called Then Came You. Kathy Lee wrote it. And she stars in it with Craig Ferguson, who you will find completely scrumptious hilarious and horrible. small okay? <laughs> he's very sexy in it okay so i get the script and you know i'm there and i'm you know and i have a free weekend as we're going into pre-production and so i made a list of places i wanted to see in glasgow now you know that i've uh, with the novels i've toured europe i've done it so i I had been to Glasgow several times, but I had never been there alone. And I had never been there without having to give a speech and then move on to another town quickly. It was kind of heaven. Glasgow kind of looks like Brooklyn or any industrial. If you're in Ohio, oh, well, I'd say it could look a little bit like Youngstown. It just does. It's just, it's a city set amongst, or maybe Cleveland would be a better, yeah, Cleveland. Set amongst the amongst this industrial shipbuilding is what they mainly did there because of the River Clyde, which is described yeah. in the book. So I started with St. Andrew's Cathedral and I went over there and I'm on foot and I'm walking and I come upon the cathedral and I was interested in it because it was Catholic. Then for 350 years, because of Mary Queen of Scots, you know that story, I don't have to repeat it. It went Protestant and then it flipped back to Catholic. And there was a wedding going on. So I began to take pictures. I stood in the back of the church. I'm a wedding crasher. I'm, I, I admit it. I don't go to the reception just to the wedding because Italians believe there's certain Italians that believe it's good luck to see a bride. My daughter will tell you that I would stop dead in the street if I saw a bride and just film her because it's good luck. So I realized this was 2018, the spring of 2018. I realized that every song that this bride chose for her wedding mass, my mother had chosen for her funeral. Oh, wow. six months earlier. So I'm sobbing in the back of the church. It's me and the bagpiper. And <laughs> note to self, 
Uh, Scottish men don't like women crying. It oh. upsets them. They turn away. They're horrified. So, but I, I, so I went outside and I filmed the bride as she came out and a man behind me says, who are you? And I turned around and it was the priest. And I said, Oh father, I'm just a tourist. Take a picture. He said, what's your name? And I told him, he said, you're Italian. He said, I, I, I thought you were Italian. And I said, I'm Italian American. He said, mm -hmm. he said, you need to see that garden. So I kept taking pictures. Poof, he was gone. Poof. I don't know where the man went. Poof, poof, gone. Wow. Then I went in the garden and it was designed by a Roman architect. And it was the memorial garden for the victims, the Italian Scots on the Aaron Doris Star. I didn't know there were Italian Scots. I didn't know there was a ship that blew up. What is this? What is happening in here? And that became the novel. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I, you know, it's interesting because even the books you refer to were Italians and Italians. And I never heard that before. It's no. Like, oh, Why I, would we? I mean, unless you spend any time. But then on my crew, there were Italians. Oh, wow. They had Italian. I said, hey, you're an Italian Scot. Yeah. Well, tell me about your people. It, it is similar to the American immigration story. But I always wonder, why so many Italians in Canada? Well, guess what? We were shipped over there. Yeah. Maybe there are Italians in Australia. That's where you sent, sent Italians sometimes when you were punishing them, or they were victims of war or prisoners of war. Yeah. And then Argentina, I saw someone there yesterday. At my oh, yeah. Right. I right. 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 went to Argentina. I mean, I, I'm sure I've got some Argentine people down there. Yeah. Oh, my God. I wrote it's about that in Bravo Valentine, which yeah. I had a ball with, because there's Argentina in that one. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I have so I, I love that story. I am a big pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. Mary Oliver's quote, living a conscious life. I'm really intentional about my life as far as what comes into my, you know, what I, I can actually be aware of and taking that. And I love how you took that story and you made this amazing book. So back to intentional. I asked you at the outset to set your intention for today in this conversation. Do you remember what that was? If you want to share, that would be awesome. My intention for today's conversation was let your words be the light. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And you picked a number in the magical guide and what page number does that fall on? There you go. <laughs> I always like the synchronicities of all of this wonder. <laughs> 156. And and it's and it's for May 22nd, but this is the one that hit me as I read along that applied to today and it said take time to dream. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's the possibility of having a dream come true that makes life interesting. Paulo Coelho, Brazilian author. Love it. I love my South American people. I do. And and uh, is there anything that in the passage and the insight that speaks to you? Well, yes. I think what you wrote here is absolutely beautiful. Yes, we wake up, get dressed, and go to work or whatever else we're scheduled to be. Yes, we have responsibilities to tend to that seek to fill the hours of our days. However, we can focus, plan, and take moments to think about what gives our hearts wings. Mm -hmm. That time invested in ourselves will be key to our mapping out our personal plan for finding joy through our dreams. Your magical key to bliss stopped me in my tracks because I'm going to tell you the, the, I mean, the wisdom that I live by. I'll get to that in a second. But it says, draw a map to guide you in the direction of your dream. Oh, wow. So, yes, tell us what you live so, by. I mean, everybody get this book, please. It's so brilliant. I have given the book, but I am going to get more to give. Oh, thank you. Oh, my gosh. I, that means the world. Talk about that because you got to come on the show. But here's the thing. A book that had a profound effect on me was given to me by Miss Scott, Billie Jean Scott, at Powell Valley High School in Big Stone Gap, Virginia, when I was in the ninth grade. Because when you're from a small town, 8th to 12th is high school. Okay? Yeah. It's not, there's no middle school. No. Screw that. <laughs> in ninth grade, she gave me a book called Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And I would underline stuff in that book, uh, eventually bought it. I didn't underline the library copy because I was raised by a librarian and I don't turn corners down unless I buy the paperback. So I just tell you a lot about me. But anyway, there's a quote in it and I changed it for my gender, but here it is. If one advances confidently in the direction of her dreams and endeavors to live the life which she has imagined for herself, 
she will meet with success unexpected in common hours. Okay. So what good. it said to me as a girl who moved to New York and didn't know anybody and somebody who didn't have any connections and somebody who didn't know uh, anything. If I just put one foot in front of the other day after day, mm -hmm. I would eventually be successful in what we call common hours. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means it's the process that matters. It's the day to day that matters. And if you can find your joy in that aspect of your work and your life, you're going to be pretty happy. That's amazing. That's beautiful. I, and uh, Louis here, he says, Adriana, be free. We love you, Louis. Be free. We love you. You know, I absolutely that just gave me goosebumps all over. I absolutely love it. Well, Meg, Meg, you that's how you live. Yeah. That's what you write about. Why wouldn't I just <laughs> okay. gravitate towards that? Love it. Yeah, the idea though is you're empowering when you're saying people to sparkle, people to shine. Yes. We're not talking about bedazzling, you know, your part. <laughs> Although nothing wrong with bedazzling. Bedazzle your soul. I with love your that. thought. Yes. With your thoughts about what you want to do. And there, I, I think I made it very clear. There's no gender. There's no age. There's no labels. Well, if there's none of that, who are you? I love What it. do you want to be? Think of Frank McCourt over the age of 70. Number one book that wrote the bestseller list for years. Wow. I want to, this is really important to me today. I want to share this with everyone because I, this is how, this is why I, people will call me author stalkers. I fall in love with authors because they speak a language. Yeah, that Meg, Meg, who else have you stalked? <laughs> oh, I, I stalked, well, I didn't stalk her, but there's so many, you know, I, I, I we'll get into that in another conversation because I, 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 I one, do I know her? So what is an author? Oh, so Paolo, well, I haven't met Paolo yet, but I've connected with him on Twitter. Good. And Liz Gilbert was one of my, you know, they say give a one female. Of your gurus. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So she, I've met her three times, but you know, <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I, I, you know what it is? I admire qualities that in them and enough. I don't, I don't think anyone's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. It's just something that I want to be more of. And when someone resonates as, as a storyteller, as a person, like I think one of your incredible, most credible attributes is not that you're already talented, that's a given. You have an incredible ability uh, in the creative realm, empowering women, empowering people. That's, but your generosity, I have, I, I, and, and, and your kind of level of success, it's, it's very rare, unfortunately, but I hope it will be less and less. Because what you give with heart, like you said, your intention was to shine through your words resonates by, by Meg, I posit you this. What kind of person would I be? I mean, seriously, what kind of person would I be if I didn't say, Meg, I see your dream. Can I, can I help you with it? But what kind of person would I be? I would be a tone deaf idiot and not nice. Well, who cares? No one cares about nice. <laughs> <Who> cares about nice? <laughs> but I look at my life, and and I have I've been very uh, uh, blessed, and, and particularly in my work life. Yeah. I'm not going to tell anybody here that I haven't taken the heat, the licks, and the pain. Okay, I, I, every day when I get up and I, I try to explain this to people, I'm going to get it. It's going to come at me. Somebody's going to say something, or tweet something, or write something that's heartbreaking. It just happens. Yeah. But when you're in the heart building business, yeah, you're going to get your heart broken. Just yeah. know that. Okay. So if you decide that you're going to come on the path, it's going to be hard. But what else have I got to do? Yeah. I mean, really? So it gives me great joy to be supportive because I understand what this took. Mm. I get it. And two children and a husband and a life. I get it. I get what this takes. I get what this takes. I get it. Yeah. So if I get it and I don't carve out time for you, you know, I, I just saw John Searles in the street. You know, you, you got to have him on this show. Um, you should have him on soon. I love him. 
He worked at Cosmo for 23 years. He was an editor at Cosmo. And you know, Cosmo is no longer, it's published like seven times a year. It's not what it was. He's also an author and he's written Strange But True. And he's got a great book out right now that just came out, another thriller. He said to me, how do you do it? And he said, you know, I used to do that. And I, I know how hard it is. I said, well, how did you do it? You do it because you want to. Because you see a need and you you go to fill it. Yeah. I'm not going to be the best interviewer. You're far better than me. But who cares? I'm doing the best I can. I read the books. I connect to the author where the, I hope they live. And I get the word out. So if I can do those little things... Okay, I, I have to insert this. No good left undone. See? Let me insert this. I have to. Adriana Inc., she is an amazing interviewer. Not only amazing, but she empowers the audience to ask questions that they would not normally have a chance to ask of these authors who just change our worlds. So that, that, you saw a need. You, I don't care how bad you were at the beginning. You are amazing now. I stunk. But here's the thing. <laughs> I don't care. You know, I always go back to this. I, I've done a, a couple of interviews with him and I love him. And I, I thought he was great in the movies. I saw Dallas Buyers Club and I thought that guy can act. He won the Oscar. Okay. Yeah. You know, Matthew McConaughey. Now, Matthew McConaughey, you might think it's a frivolous character in the world of Hollywood because he's good looking. Yes. Well, if you get past that and you do when you read his book because you yeah. start to completely relate to him. I mean, as a person. Yes. You realize that he's kind of followed the things that you believe in, Meg, and your rules for living. He really does. He writes everything down. He manifests it. He makes goals. He sets them and he reaches them. Now, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been hard, that he hasn't been challenged, that he hasn't failed miserably. We all fail miserably, including like Da Vinci, all of us. 50% of, of the time, we stink. 50% of the time... <laughs> We may get there, okay? Yeah. But I, I think yeah. about McConaughey because if you haven't read Green Lights, it's a primer for living. And all it takes is a pencil and a notebook, really. That's all he had at his disposal. But then his life comes into focus. So I was able to talk to him. I was a little stunned because I went in there guns blazing, like excited. Yeah. He met me there. Because he understood, I understood. Well, yeah. what, what else is empathy? What else are these platforms ah. for except to like pull us closer together? Ah. Because when the moment comes, when those tanks roll over the border and they, they want you to give up who you are, where you live, how you make a living, what you believe in, oh, you bet I'm going to be making those Molotov cocktails in my kitchen and throwing them out the window. <laughs> throwing eggs at these people and so on and so forth. <laughs> you got to know what you're going to live for and you got to know what you was worth dying for. Uh, and none of it can be taken for granted. That's the big one. And I learned that from Matthew McConaughey. Who knew? Who, who knew? knew? This wonderful actor, this wonderful intuitive actor. Yeah. Who knew he could write like that? Who knew that this was the tip? Of, and who knew? Look, look, I'm sure you get sick of people asking, well, who are you in love with on the scene? He didn't care about that. What he cares about is imparting this energy force. Yeah. Uh, take your life by the reins and ride it, baby, because nobody else will do it like you do. Yeah. Ah, I, yes, 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 yes. And if you watch the two of you and the dynamic that you had in the interview, you could tell your excitement and his excitement met the moment. What you were talking about was important. So not only did he evolve, and even in that conversation, the book actually was on display, but you saw him for the person that he has become. And you brought that to the table. And that's why so many people just totally were fascinated because you made him feel like Elizabeth is saying, like all of us. And that is the gift. Well, because God. he is. What makes an artist, what makes a book work is, does it speak to me? Yes. And when it speaks to me, do I hear it? Do I hear it? You know, the great um, 
Sam Goldwyn, I hope it's Sam Goldwyn and not Daryl F. Sanic said, no, it's Sam Goldwyn said, if you want to, if you want to deliver a message to the American public, uh, 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 send a telegram. Oh. <laughs> you, don't, you don't, you don't preach at people. Yeah. You pull them close and say, let's, let's get into what you're feeling. Yeah. Let me empathize with you, yeah. which is why the Ukraine people will win. Yes. They I will heard. win. They will win. I heard this morning it's going to be a draw. No, 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 no. They've won. Yeah. They, they've won. I love it. And where's and, my friend? Where's my Jewish girlfriend here? Oh, uh, Rachel. <laughs> I don't know where she went, but yeah. Look at Zelensky. Oh, is now, Zelensky. is that a Jewish boy from way back? What a story. Brilliant. Funny. Educated. What a and story. he doesn't quit. It's, quite, it's kind of beautiful. It's a message to the world, isn't it? You know, I think it is. And I wanted to kind of bring it back around to this point because who we are certainly lends a hand to the legacy that our lives were built on. For instance, for, in for instance, one of the things that resonated with me mostly is that how close you were with your grandmothers. Oh, yeah. And oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, very close. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably. And what they well, gave... Even the one that was in Minnesota on the Iron Range, I mean, we their letters are incredible, which she saved. I have all the letters I wrote to her. Oh, that's so beautiful. And the, and the, the, the fact of the matter is where they left off, they passed the torch on. And what you're doing, and I'm sure your family as well, because all of you are from that from that beautiful seed that you were talking about initially, right? Those seeds that just one, one thing that they can leave you can grow beyond your wildest imagination. But what I read, and it was like, oh, this this just broke me because, you know, my book, Butterfly Awakens, is about losing yep. my mom. When yeah. you wrote, and, I, and, and of course, I tab my books too, like you do, right? But I'm drawing in them. No one worries about you like your mother. Um. When this goes, the world seems unsafe. You spoke to me. And I felt not only your beautiful librarian mother, who was probably the accolades should have come, but that, okay, I have to say this. My sister went to Notre Dame and everybody in my family loves Notre Dame, but I know St. Mary's is awesome because look what they also brought out St. to the Mary's, world. baby. St. <laughs> Mary's. I'm just getting a picture of my mom here. I want you to get okay. a picture awesome. of your mother. Awesome. But this is my mother with my daughter. Oh my God. Oh, now you can see that my daughter's blonde. She, oh her God. hair is light brown now, but she was a blondie. My husband was very blonde. He was toe headed. Oh, and wow. uh, yeah, because people used to speak Spanish to me. They thought I was the nanny. <laughs> my mother with my daughter. My sister Antonia took that photo and it's my favorite. Oh, thing. And I have it right here on my desk. Oh my God. But you wrote those words about your, but about your, I think it was about your grandmother. That was in Big Stone Gap. Oh, wow. It's actually in the movie. We took out the word unwieldy. I acquiesced. It was wow. asked, I was asked to remove it. I removed it. I didn't really want to. Yeah. Uh, and Ashley Judd says it in the movie at, uh, at the funeral of her mother. Oh, wow. But you, but it's so important, like how our mothers impact our lives. And, and I wanted to say this because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you had my mother not passed on me writing the book and me really wanting to, to, to talk to you. Man, you were heartbroken. Yeah. Heartbroken. You broke your heart. Yeah. And your kids were little and, uh, but she did a great job with you and you're doing a great job with your kids and that's all she wanted. And by the way, she wants you to be happy. Yeah. And if, and, and your writing makes you happy and I can tell by reading you. Your show makes you happy. Your connection, your yeah. empathy, your encouragement, your everything that you said to me, I throw right back at you. It's yeah. a boomerang. It's basically a boomerang. Um, she did such a beautiful job with you, and she prepared you. She prepared you, and you know, I, I watched an interview with Sandra Bullock, like on CBS Sunday Morning. I love that show. And she adopted two children. I don't even like the word adopted because she, it's basically to me, you just found your family. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. She has two children and her children happen to be African-American descent. And she said, I related to the hundred years of women, brown and black women who could never relax in their motherhood 
couldn't relax in it because yeah. their children are brown and they know how what society will do to them. Well, now that was Sunday. What's today? Is today Wednesday? It's Wednesday. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. I thought about it all day yesterday. So the day before, I'm going on these long walks and I'm going, oh my God. I wow. thought about that. And then I thought about the great Alice Randall. Now, Alice Randall wrote the, uh, the, the Wind Done Gone, Black Bottom Saints. I love that. I'm an Alice Randall fan. She also wrote some hit country songs. Oh, wow. African American. I love her. Yeah. Black Bottom Saints will just, it's a novel that will set you on your ear. But anyway, she said something. We have not gotten to the root of this conversation in this country because we enslaved black people and brought them here. I mean, that's exactly what happened. And uh, you can't change history. And people will say, well, well we need to get over it. <laughs> don't get over it. You empathize. Yeah. And she said this, and I want everybody to hear this because this, I'm still thinking about this. Alice Randall said, I want you to think of the, the enslaved women who were raped and gave birth to these babies and loved those babies. Yes. Wow. Those of African American descent survived mm -hmm. because and thrived because of that love. Yeah. They didn't judge it. They loved them. And there's women right now gonna go, oh my gosh. Well, I didn't mean to bring you down, but if you think if you if you if you think with with all of your intellect and all of your emotional bandwidth and your heart, as you always point out to us, Meg, to lead with your heart, lead with it, lead with it. You can't be tribal. Yeah, you can only be one person to another getting us through this. Yeah, they loved those babies. And I think one of the things that you said that resonates with me right now, the beauty of that is that because in your home they felt love, then they can go out into the world and be loving to others. And you can I'm so tired of that community getting a bad rap. Yeah. For anybody who spent time and, and been in the African-American community, they're powerhouses. They're powerhouses. Okay. Just like my grandmother used to say, hey, everybody the Italian isn't great. Right? <laughs> no, yeah. We all have our bad apples. Everybody yeah. does. Yeah. But to not embrace the splendor, the magnificence, mm. the stories, that's why you got to run out. I, I gave it away in the street or I'd hold it up. Mm -hmm. Daniel Black's book. You got to oh. read them. Yeah. You know, this is part of what, this is part of the evolution. Yeah. Of this country. In 100 years, it'll be better. And in 500 years, it will be framed in a certain way that you look through the patina of history, you'll be like, oh, really? Was that Why was that a problem? Exactly. And then as we sit here, a Supreme Court, uh, you know, uh, possibility is getting questioned. And the first African-American woman who it was the dream of her ancestors, what possibly was a complete result of being loved where she sat, where she was. And I have to say this, one of the beautiful, th the beautiful things of being Italian and in my family, let's say, is the fact that we are loved so we can include others and welcome them to the table. And I love, love, it. love you're right. Love is the, the sun and the water of the big heart. Yeah. It's, it, it makes it grow, right? Love it. Um, love it. And, and, and I want to say this too, again, Look in the world and look at what is actually being said and what happens. I see our first Supreme Court nominee, yeah. completely fabulous and completely brilliant. Mm -hmm. And somebody wants her scores. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't think they asked for anyone else's scores in the history of anything. I, it makes me laugh. Right. And then they bring up other things that are said. OK, listen, I know the tribalism. I get it. But my point in saying this and bringing this up. Please embrace this. If you embrace nothing else, if you're a woman, it's going to be harder for you. Always. It's going to be harder. But OK, bring it on. Bring it on. Underestimate us. Go yeah. ahead. 
that, this is going to be hilarious. <laughs> yes. Keep, 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 underestimate me. I love it. I was going to ask you for your final inspiration right now. That's, it. that's perfect. Underestimate me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Underestimate you. Underestimate us. I love at it. At your own peril. Your at own. your own peril and your own loss. I, you know, I think that one of the most amazing things that we all can take away from that today is that when you have people who have their dreams clarified and follow that path, that guide, then there's nothing you can do like the Ukrainians, like anyone else who is held tight right. to let that dream give up. They will never give up. And that is, so I, so I applaud you. I'm going to put your beautiful cover back up again. April 26, 2022, this book, The Good Left Undone, comes to bookstores. Please go out there and order it. It's fantastic. It's a beautiful, beautiful story that will captivate your heart and your soul and really empower you to be the kind of person that you want to be because of the stories that inspire us. So, Adriana, I, I can't tell you. I mean how grateful I am. Karma, I believe, is a mirror. I must be doing something good in this world that I have this conversation today with you. You are an inspiration. You are an inspiration for women. I think everyone here is saying that was amazing. Thank you, Meg, because I got this conversation to be shared with my people too. And you know, the reality is, is that what we put on the world will come back to you. So I wish you all the bliss and joy and success so that you keep doing what you're doing effortlessly in many respects so you don't get too tired so we can keep hearing stories written by you on the screen or in our rooms we get to sit down and have our little cup of coffee at 2 30 in the morning apparently that i need to get up at and and just be well, don't get up too early you need your <laughs> sleep but the point is <laughs> Everybody that wants to create, get up a couple hours earlier and by gut, you're, you're going to see you can do it. And I do encourage everyone, watch her show, Adriana Inc. Sign up for her newsletter. She's got so many wonderful people on there. She is wonderful and what she brings. You actually will get a wisdom hit or something, I'm sure, one of those conversations to take back with you. And it will be a life changer, game changer, all of the above. Happy to support beautiful women like you, Adriana. You're amazing. Thank you. And you want to know about her family? Don't sing at the table, you guys. I adored this book. And it really is. She That's me. Me. That's me and my brother. Oh, it's you. Oh, my God. Did anybody notice on the cover of this book that I am wearing an outfit that's made from curtain material? See the curtains <laughs> in the background? Yeah. All right. That's how we grew up, that we could sew, and that's what we did. I love it. I my love it. Made that outfit. Oh, oh my God. God. But you know what? You make me proud to be an Italian American too, which I oh, think I'm so is glad. amazing. And I'm happy to you know, pass it on to others who need to hear it. So well, you're beautiful and I love you and I'm thrilled and the magical guide to bliss, everybody get it. Thank you so much. You guys, all of you remember we're deliberate creators of our life. Dream big and let's all raise the positive vibrations on the planet. And Start with love. Let's love ourselves exactly where we are. Reach out to each other and can you just spread that love? Time to manifest the life of our dreams. Get out there and do it. Wishing you all bliss. Thank you so much, Adriana. This is wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank all you of for it. having me. All right.